All right. Fly into the future. A little bit of updraft, up but it's very small. Oh, there we got a bit of one. The design that could provide the commercial aircraft of Beyond 2000. Thanks for joining us. In this edition, two very new but extremely different aircraft. The first manned glider was invented by an Englishman, Sir George Cayley. Did he fly it first? No way. In 1853, it carried his coachman about 450 metres, just 1,500 feet. So why didn't he try it himself? Simple. The pilot had absolutely no control over the craft whatsoever. That, of course, is no longer the case with the personal gliders of today and later we'll meet the pilots who do have the courage to test their own work. Incidentally, the latest designs look nothing like this. There is something to cheer about when you're one of the few to launch on a day when there's very little wind and only the birds can make the most of the conditions. Hang gliding is considered the ultimate flying experience because it's as close as a person gets to flying as free as a bird. Yet today's hang gliders are little more than sophisticated kites. Their portability makes them very convenient. Yet their performance is limited largely by the endurance of the pilot and the whims of the weather. And although today's conditions look perfect, there are some thermals out there that that hang glider can't fly. The aim of most hang glider pilots is to stay up in the air for as long as possible and to travel as far as possible. But since foot-launched aviation became a serious sport 20 years ago, these craft have been unable to break through a variety of performance barriers. While more streamlined design, improved materials and construction and increasing pilot fitness and expertise have all helped, Essentially, these flyers have not completely entered the world of the bird, the bat, or the butterfly. So here we move the turbulence separation back a ways. But give a computer to a group of aeronautical buffs from Stanford University, add some numbers to crunch, and it's amazing what they'll come up with. Let's try and... To begin with, a design that looks nothing like a hang glider. And then, a couple of models to flight test the result. Part of the reason for building these was to get an idea for the size of the control surfaces that would be useful in flying the thing, giving good handling qualities. So now I'm not moving the flaps at all, and I can pitch up, and I can pitch down. Despite what it may seem, trying to emulate perfect flight, this is not just a page out of the boy's own annual. These enthusiasts, a professor and his postgraduate students, are in the forefront of designing the next generation of commercial flying machines. It's, despite the fact that we had the computer models, we're not quite sure that those really represent the flying qualities, and so this is a step toward the full-scale model. In fact, two full-scale models almost complete prototypes that leave Leonardo da Vinci and many others far behind. This is test flight day one, and it doesn't take long to feel that what's been created is quite remarkable. Swift by name, swift by nature. A flying wing designed to outperform any other sailplane and cobbled together by a bunch of flyers working day and night with materials far removed from wax and feathers, wires and sailcloth. Ultra lightness is the first priority. To be able to foot launch and land the Swift, the wings have to be very, very light, yet incredibly strong. Now that's almost a contradiction in terms for a wing this size. You see, a standard sailplane has a smaller wing, yet it's twice as heavy. This one weighs about 41 pounds or 18 kilograms. Running its full length, 
is a carbon fibre spar. There's a bit of Kevlar in that. And the skin is very, very thin, about one and a half millimetres. It's made of a sandwich of Kevlar and polyurethane foam. And it's bonded together with epoxy. Gliding conditions on this first day are not ideal. Nonetheless, not a bad tryout. This wing is no longer flyable. <laughs> Our basic goal here was to make it possible not just to stay in the air on a very light day, but to start going places. So the Swift is really designed to go at twice the speed of a hang glider, and that allows you to cover much more distance, and the glide angle is much shallower, which allows you to go farther for a given loss in altitude. And so to test flight day two, and more light conditions. The pilot's main control is with this joystick. It moves the elevons up or down together or independently for turning and for greater speed. But it's the flaps which give the Swift its greatest advantage. They make these wings very efficient over a wide range of speeds. But perhaps most importantly, they allow the craft, when they're pulled down like this, to slow down enough for the pilot to make a pinpoint foot landing. A little cycle coming up. Being able to actually take off today is the major concern. And Swift co-developer Eric Beckman again leads the way. All right. <laughs> See if we can't find some lift. Might be able to lengthen the flight at all if I can find some, some little bit of thermals. With the easy hand controls and the half sitting position, Eric is able to relax. Unlike hang glider pilots, he doesn't have to hang on or twist his body using its weight to steer or control the craft. Now, as we're flying around, I have a real advantage because I'm able to penetrate any sink more quickly. Sink describes the smallest rate of height loss achievable by the glider and occurs at slow flying speeds but it's the high-speed capability which gives the Swift its biggest advantage, allowing it to get to thermals, the rising bubbles of warmer air that provide lift, which the slower hang gliders can't. We're basically not, not getting any real lift of any consequence, so... The Swift's glide ratio is twice that of a hang glider. For every 25 metres travelled in still air, it will lose just one metre in height. A performance advantage for long-haul cross-country competition flying and landing where you want to. Now with the Swift, I'm able to fly a little bit lower before I actually decide to go out to the beach because I'm able to glide further. I can leave the hill with a little less altitude and still safely make it to the landing area. But before Eric lands, let's find out why the development of the Swift, a recreational plane, could be so important to commercial aviation. Well, people are looking at very large airplanes. There's quite a demand with increasing airport congestion for fewer airplanes, each carrying more cargo. And one application is a very large airplane that weighs perhaps a million pounds that has the same sort of configuration that the Swift does. Now I'll get ready here. I've got enough flaps for a nice landing. I lower my weight down. I haven't got any wind, so I'm going to have to bring it in quickly. There we go. All right. That was good. Just let my shoulder straps get off me there. Okay. And there we are. 